morning, everybody. It's Dr. Linda of the Vascular Birthmarks Foundation. Today, I am here with Dr. Stuart Nelson of the Beckman Laser Institute. You can see um, some of you. We have a Facebook launched a new system today, so we're like um, sorting this out. But um, also because of COVID, we're still not doing our in-person live sessions, but I will be doing those very soon. Um, also, um, next month, we'll have Dr. Buddy Cohen. Hi, Scott, of the vascular, um, Dr. Buddy Cohen of John Hopkins, and followed by Dr. Ann Comey. So today's session, and um, I'm so thankful for Dr. Nelson. Say hi to everybody, Dr. Nelson. Stay well and safe, everybody. And, and you can give us an update on how COVID's going in California. Well, unfortunately, California is, like many of the states, not as bad as Texas, Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina. But there has been a surge recently in Southern California. Uh, regrettably, most of the people aren't following the public health instructions to social distance and stay away from gatherings. So there has been a bit of a spike. Uh, here recently in California. So um, I'm just looking here because this is a new setup. Aaron's on. Aaron Miller. Hi, Aaron. Um, Tar Tara Garrett. Hello from Jax. Jax is saying hi to you, Dr. Nelson. Um, Chelsea's on. Hi, Chelsea. Vincent Pentecost is on. So again, this is a new setup for Facebook Live. I'm trying to pull it up on my phone so I can also get a better view of. Uh, the pictures so let me just get in here so um dr nelson um while we're waiting for some questions what are the precautions now that you're taking at your institute to you know keep yourself safe and keep your patients safe well i think i sent you last friday after i came out of the home or or one of my nurses took a picture of me it might be helpful actually if you post that on we, we did we shared it on 59 groups <laughs> Uh, Wyoming, Oregon, uh, Nevada, Arizona uh, will actually 
test has to be done within 72 hours of the, of the anesthesia visit. But at least the system here on campus has worked very well. Patients have told me they have an appointment, they drive up in their car, they know the staff here at UCI at the testing site knows they're coming. Uh, they don't even have to get out of the car. They swap them in the parking lot outside the Gallagher Behind Institute, and it takes about five minutes of the patient's time. And then I see the result in the computer the following morning before we go to the OR. So actually, it's, it's worked quite well. I was a little bit hesitant, but the families have been understanding. We're all in this together, and we realize that at least for the next six to nine to 12 months, this is going to be the way we're going to practice medicine. And who knows after that, right? I mean, who knows? I mean, well, I'm consciously optimistic. I listened to Dr. Fauci and I listened to the other people at NIH. And before I came on this call, we have these meetings of the University of California faculty. And there's always the epidemiologist on. And the epidemiologist is saying definitely going to be a surge in early November in the United States. But they're cautiously optimistic they'll have a vaccine at the beginning of the year. And fortunately for me, as a primary health care provider, I would be one of the first people vaccinated. So that's great. And we have a lot of people logging in. No questions yet, but Corinne is saying hi. Eric Pixley, Abel Piles, Kristen's on. A lot of our file followers are on. And just so everybody knows, Facebook launched a new Facebook Live system. So I'm on the learning curve. Linda Lynch is on. Hi from Scotland. Hi, Linda. So today is the triple test because <laughs> uh, Dr. Nelson can't see any of the questions, so I'll be reading them all to him. But what's really good too, before the questions roll in, is he's giving us a really, really good oversight into how um, prepared and how much protection is in place and how he's happy to be back to work, for one thing. Right, Dr. Nelson? Um, I think my than I'm back to work. <laughs> um, I actually had the pleasure of going to New York City last Wednesday and being in Dr. Geronimus's office to see the process, how it was working, how they were doing their personal protection. And it was very similar to what you say, only one person's even allowed on the elevator to go up to his floor with the patient. Only one person's allowed in the room. Everyone is masked. Um, everybody is wearing personal protection. The, the parents that come in have to wear a mask. Um, it's all done very, very well, but both of you have been up and running, and there'll be a lot of people writing in from, like, Linda from Scotland because the UK is just not lasering yet. We have our first question from Deborah Pezzo to Vinan. Hi, Dr. Nelson. When you start seeing international patients due to COVID-19, it's very hard to book a ticket. So how far in advance can we book an appointment? Deborah Ann Seamus from Grand Cayman. Actually, I was just thinking about Deborah Ann and her daughter. With her, I think she has a lower extremity capillary vascular malformation. Uh, right now, we, I have not seen an international patient since we reopened on May 11th. We've certainly seen lots of patients from Southern California, lots from Texas, lots from Arizona, Nevada, and Oregon, uh, Colorado as well. But I have not yet seen a patient. I mean, the, problem, the question is, what's going on at the government level? You know, for example, the Bas they've got the Basket of Birds Park Foundation, but ISPA was going to have a meeting in fact for Canada, which was canceled last month. Not only did ISPA cancel the meeting because of COVID, but I couldn't even travel to Vancouver because there's a travel restriction between the United States and Canada. So it really depends on what's going on at the international level. I mean, certainly, uh, patients can book appointments. Uh, what I will say, my experience with the air carriers is that most of the air carriers understand the situation and are saying, look, if you book the flight, you can totally change it without penalty, restriction, anything else. And I've actually got at least three trips planned that hopefully I'll be able to make. But it's with the understanding that if there is an issue with COVID, I will change those flights and there will be no penalty. There will be no change of ticket fees or things like that. But uh, if you're willing to travel, uh, we're willing to see your daughter here at Beckham. And um, just to piggyback on that, Dr. Um, Giacomo Coletti is actually begin, begun treating patients with the PDL, and he's um, doing port wine stings in Milan. All the airlines are now open in Milan because they've very much stabilized the situation. 
the borders are all open. He's got several patients that VBF referred to him in the last two weeks that are driving from London and Germany to, because they couldn't get flights. So we also have a fixed rate of 500 euros with Dr. Coletti um, for um, any laser treatment. He doesn't use general anesthesia. He will do a nerve block for older patients. So it's an option. Um, Dr. Uh, Geronimus has been up and running and Dr. Nelson since, I think around the first of the month, right, Dr. Nelson? Oh, no, we started May 11th. Oh, May 11th, okay. So um, Janine Kane from Scotland has a question for you. She wants to know if any laser is effective with treating a lymphatic malformation. No, lymphatic malformations are not going to respond uh, to laser treatment. Now, if there is an area on the surface of the skin that's red as a result of the lymphatic malformation, one could consider using the pulse dye laser to treat that. But lymphatic malformations are deeper. They're underneath the skin. Unfortunately, they tend to invade the underlying soft tissue and muscle. And basically, lymphatic malformations we treat in our institution by combined scleral therapy and also the oral medications, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And we have found that to be much, much more effective. But really, lasers, unfortunately, uh, don't have a role in the treatment of lymphatic malformations. Well, with, with one exception. And that would be with the uh, vesicles on the tongue. They respond to the ND YAG laser, correct? Well, they do, but they also, in our experience, and our, my colleague, Kari Nelson, just published a paper, which is about to come out, uh, that showed how successful the phosphodiesterase inhibitors are with the scleral therapy. I mean, having an ND YAG laser treatment in the mouth and the tongue is very, very painful. Right. I mean, if I were the patient, and plus you've got to worry about swelling after the procedure, True. So, at least if this were my child, I would look first at the combined scleral therapy phosphodiesterase inhibitor approach uh, to treat my child's malformation before I'd be willing to have them treated by a deeply penetrating ND agulus. Well, this is um, a new treatment information that I'm hearing for the first time that Kari, Dr. Nelson, and you know that you're telling us about. So, I would love to have us get that information and that information on that paper out to all of our families because if this is and you know hopefully because she's supposed to be um, speaking at our conference in December if all is well we do have plan B that Kristen and the VBF staff are working on um, you know if something happens although Governor Cuomo has said we will not go on a pause if there's an upsurge again but again who knows who'll be able to come or not. So we will work out an alternative if, if we don't go have a live conference like we're planning. And Dr. Carrie Nelson is um, planning on speaking. So this would be great if she would present on this because so many of our families with lymphatic malformations have very few options. Well, the paper's in press. So I hope I'll email her right after I get off this uh, live chat. Wow. Yes. Uh, yeah, we would. The PDF would be great, and this is just such great news. You know, this is why these VBF live sessions are so amazing. Because here you are, you're on the front line with the physician, just going to press, and we're hearing it live. Just, and it's not even published. So this is this is why we exist to bring this current information to all our families. Um, and uh, Cynthia Culp is saying, thank you so much for this group. I found your specialist using the foundation for port wine strain treatment near me. Um, she's looking forward for her appointment. Um, June Kane says hi. Svantla Kozowski saying hi. Linda, who is again the one from Europe, said she has a port wine stain on her face. She had laser treatment with the copper and dye. Oh, my gosh. We, that's a long time ago, huh, Stuart? And That's like 1970s, early 1980. I don't even think they made copper vapor laser. Right. And she said she heard that they've improved a lot, but she can't get any further information to her blood vessels being too date deep in Scotland. But I think, um, so what we're working on right now, and we're hoping either Dr. Nelson or Dr. Geronimus, likely Dr. Nelson, he's our doctor that likes to travel. We are well, going to... My parents are both Scottish. I should definitely be traveling soon. 
Scott. Right. So, well, what we are saying is we are working on two free laser clinics in Europe. One will be in Athens and one will be in Verona where Dr. Coletti will be starting a new clinic in vascular anomalies, so we're hoping to get those scheduled, and then anyone from Europe can come and get a free treatment. Uh, Dr. Tom Brees and myself are meeting in London to establish a clinic there too, where we'll be more progressive with affordable laser care. So don't give up and, and come to our conference window or come to one of our free laser sessions in Europe. You'll, you'll be able to try it, You'll, you'll be amazed at how well the lasers have come along. Even if you have cobbling and a thick port wine stain, our global ambassador director, Scott Couples, had a very thick uh, port wine with cobbling, and Dr. Uh, Geronimus has been using the Prima on him, and he looks really, really good. Um, Janine Kane wants to know, what would the photo, okay, oh, phosphophidister, <laughs> inhibitors be? My son's doctors aren't keen on serolimus. Well, they're not the serolimus. Actually, they're the most well-known for the treatment of benign prostatic hypertrophy and erectile dysfunction. I mean, the sedenafil as well as the talodenafil. I mean, these were where these drugs were actually developed to modify blood flow. So it's actually, as I said, you'd be looking in the benign prostatic hypertrophy literature, the erectile dysfunction literature, as well as also their drugs have moved from there now into the treatment of lymphatic malformations, but they've been tested. They've even been used in children. I mean, the original report of psilocybin uh, was done in children at Stanford by Dr. Anna Lane several years ago, where there were several children with very bad lymphatic malformations of the head and neck or the ICU at Stanford intubated because of airway compromise, and they were able to demonstrate the tremendous reduction in the volume of those lymphatic malformations after these children were placed on the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Wow, that's amazing. And one of the new features that I'm working on rolling out this year, especially because a lot of good has come out of COVID where we are having the same amount of amazing access to international experts and able to bring them to you to VBF even though they're not sitting next to me, like Dr. Nelson's in California in sunny Southern California, and I'm in Niskayuna, New York, where it's actually 92 degrees today, so it's nicer in California than here. But we're gonna be um, doing, I'm gonna be starting subspecialty uh, Facebook Live sessions, so maybe Dr. Uh, Kari Nelson and I can do one on the lymphatic malformations. I've got two doctors that are gonna do with, one with me on FABA for that specialty group. And um, so this is a new feature that I want to add this year is not just a generalist, but to get to the people that have that more difficult subspecialty condition. So I'd like to, t to test that with Dr. Kari Nelson. Maybe we could do a session just for families affected by lymphatic malformations. I mean, what do you think about that, Dr. Nelson? Absolutely. I mean, the, the name Kari is certainly available. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, that she'll stay highly involved in, in uh, PBF. I don't know whether you know this, but she has left the University yeah. of California, Irvine. Her last day was about 10 days ago, but she's now in private practice here in Orange County. So we still have access to her as a resource, uh, but she's no longer full-time at the university. Yeah, she told me that, and she said she wants to stay um, involved, and she's very much looking forward to coming to the conference. and. When I come out next month, um, I'm hoping to meet with her and Dr. Hasso and yourself. We're actually talking right now about some meetings when I come out. So we have some questions. Cynthia said she started laser treatment on her port wine in the early 90s and stopped it. Five years ago, she had um, undiagnosed ABM removed from her brain. I'm so excited to see a, a specialist in birthmarks. That's very interesting. But, you know, we talk about this too, Dr. Nelson, where, you know, people only it was like the work with Dr. Marty Mim and VBF when we would sit around brainstorming that some of these stains that people think are port wine are really AVM stains and not a, a typical port capillary malformation, right? And they've all been misdiagnosed. 
Yeah, that's very, very true. I mean, we're ordering a lot more magnetic resonance imaging studies with Galilean contrast of the head and neck than we ever had because now we actually understand that there really is a subset of patients who have very high flow lesions, which really probably do fall into the arterial venous, you know, malformation classification. So that is definitely. So we have another question for you from Dinah Taylor. She says, hi, Linda and Dr. Nelson. My son is four. We've been treating his port wine stain with Dr. Nelson since he was 15 months old. So this, the mom is Dinah Taylor. Um, thank, yeah, she said, thank you to the wonderful staff. Her son has such a positive experience and actually looks forward to his treatments. She is concerned about COVID. She's saying, um, it seems scary for a child. I don't want it to ruin his perception of going for treatment. Is there a different test for children other than the nose swab? Unfortunately, I'm not an expert in infectious diseases or COVID-19, but to my knowledge, no. I mean, they're for the antigen, I mean, for the actual test, what you have it. Now, for the antibody test, the serology test, there's a whole variety of tests for that. But we have found, as I said, that we schedule it for you. You go, you drive in, you get the test. I mean, I have not heard any issues of parents who have been complaining about having their children uh, getting the nasal swab. Um, what I was, most complaints I've had with the parents are in Beckman, we used to let the parent go into the OR while the child was actually being put asleep. And our anesthesiologists and the environmental health people and the infection control people have said no can't do that anymore. So several of the parents were actually a little upset about that, but it turned out when we took their child who was three, four, five, six years old and took them into the OR, the children were absolutely fine. I mean, many of these children have been here multiple times. They trust us. They play with our child health care specialist, uh, Nicole. They're very comfortable. They didn't cry. In fact, the parents are crying more than the children actually are. So, that's been the one change that I've noticed. It's been more that the parents are a little concerned. Gee, is my child going to be upset when they stop at the door and take them away? And uh, that really has not been an issue at all. You know, that's a real important um, point that you bring up because I'm currently working with um, a Duke graduate. She she had funding to do a study, and we're and we created a survey which, which is assessing the impact of COVID-19 on vascular birthmarks. Um, anomalies and related syndromes and we're pretty close to launching it and I'm going to add that about what impact has resumption of treatments had because you bring up a good point that now with COVID the process has changed where before the children were used to it the parents were used to it and this is a this is can be seen as a negative impact by some families is what you're saying even though you're well, I, I thought it to me and email me and I told them and they were very concerned but when we actually had to go into the OR the children were fine with it uh, it's because they play with our child health care specialist Nicole they know Nicole they trust Nicole they go in with their bubbles their videos their games so I think it's a, really more of an issue of trust that these families know or the children know that we're going to take care of them that they're going to be fine and that they're going to see their parents uh, in their recovery room after I mean, the biggest impact of this is actually been because we had to close for a couple of months. I mean, many of the children went through a big growth spurt. Yes. You know, as a result of going through that growth spurt, their vascular malformation has gotten a lot darker. Yes. And my child from Texas, last week, uh, I recognized the father immediately, but I didn't recognize his son because he'd grown several inches since I last <laughs> remember. So, as we know, any changes in rapid growth spurts, puberty, all vascular malformations get worse. And so that's been probably the biggest impact that I've noticed because there was a bit of a delay in keeping children on a sort of schedule. Some children's vascular malformations have gotten a little bit darker, but I'm very confident that I've told the parents, look, we need to do two or three treatments at shorter intervals, maybe six weeks, and we'll be right back to where we were and that they shouldn't be concerned about that. Yeah, and so in case I forget, because I know Kristen and Corinne are on from VBF, um, we need to add these two things to our COVID impact survey that did your child have a growth spurt during the quarantine 
and then also the other one about the process changing and was that perceived as a negative or positive so if I forget <laughs> because I can't write it down right now you guys can remind me um so again Dr. Nelson like Deborah uh, Pezo to Vanan she's as soon as the borders are open she's looking to book a trip they're just not sure when it will be but they definitely you know want to go um and she wants to know how bad is this forced break in treatment going to be on reaching her child's maximum clearance well as i said i think the impact of this has been that we need to sort of catch up and in order to do that what we've been sort of talking to families is about this look you know to get you back to where you were and to get the biggest you know clearance but the child's birthmark we need to do perhaps two maybe three treatments at intervals that are short around you know four to six weeks and then we can get these kids back to where they were so i think overall long term i don't think it's going to be a major issue so I, that's what i've been talking to families about and um, i think that's sort of where we're headed i've talked to my colleagues i've spoken with roy and, and we both sort of feel the same way we both have seen this that because of the shutdown and the quarantine there are some children that we just didn't see for six seven eight months I and mean, this is why we want to do for many of these kids a maintenance treatment you know every six months or so just to these children grow and particularly if they're going through a growth spurt there's no doubt their vascular malformations get darker well that is like of all the years we've been working together and this is like mine and yours probably 10th facebook live that's the first time i've ever heard you talk about something so significant as when your child is going through a growth spurt and if there's a period of time between treatments you could see and you almost always will see a darkening of it because it's hormone modulated correct along with the so yeah this is this is important information that we really need to make sure that everybody is aware of like if your child has gone through an extreme growth spurt you know girls hit it at certain times boys this is a time maybe you want to be more diligent. And if they are in maintenance, maybe you want to step that up a little bit to stay ahead of it, right? I mean, you might even suggest that, staying ahead of it if they're going through a growth spurt. Or, or particularly if they're going through puberty. Yes. Very, very challenging time. So Jill Hart Kitson wants to know, is the Prima Laser any more reliable or, or is it still having technical difficulties? Do you think it's effective on lower extremities? Well, um, I, Candela was here yesterday because we needed to have a dye change and it was time we did our first pilot dye. But apparently there has been a software modification. The problem with the Prima, it was the injection of the dye into the laser cavity. That was erratic. You know, I don't want to get into a discussion about you know, the physics of how these devices work. The, the dye goes in, it's excited by a flash lamp, and you get the yellow light. There was problems with the amount of the dye that was being injected into the laser cavity, and so the energies that were coming out were a little bit unstable. And in fact, in Beckman, we were actually measuring these on a weekly basis. One of my fellows and junior researchers, Wang Kung Jia, was actually every Monday measuring the output at the different energy densities and different pulse durations. So Ken Dell has told me that that problem has been solved now. So again, you know, we're gonna we're gonna check it. Don't take their word for it. Fortunately, again, I work at an institute where I've got these technology people, but we can get an energy meter and we can actually go measure it ourselves. And so we intend to do that. And so while we've been reassured that the problem has been solved, we'll just have to see. Uh, certainly, the extremity, the lower extremity vascular malformations can be treated. Uh, the advantages of the Prima are because of the larger spot size, the treatment is much faster. So you treat a very, very large surface area very, very quickly. Also, because the device is more powerful, and again, because of the larger spot sizes, you can get a higher energy density deeper in the skin as compared to using the conventional perfecta systems. So taken together, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to see improved clearance of lower extremity vascular. And I, I can testify because I had Dr. Nelson test the Prima laser on me because I was hoping to get like, you know, some firming of the skin, a little cosmetic benefit. And I wanted to also see what it felt like. 
and it was very few pulses because like you said it's a 15 but i got that bruising remember and you said that's the one that's off that's where it's off so you were i had i experienced it um you turned it down but i wanted to see so that i can tell people i went through it i know what it feels like but i know you said what you're experiencing was it was turned down right very mildly on me Oh. So he measured them. It was about a joule or one energy level, about 15% too high. So we were actually turning the energy densities down for the treatment as compared to what we, the, the laser itself was telling us. The other big issue that we've noticed with the Prima is because you're getting more like deeper into the skin, children have a lot more swelling post on Yes, we've been getting that feedback. So what we've been doing is that immediately before the child is away, Right after the treatment, if we're not doing it under anesthesia, we're immediately putting ice packs on those children and you know, taking advantage of immediately cooling down the skin because families have definitely reported, and I've seen it on children I've seen postoperatively, that you get a lot more swelling after the treatment treatments as compared to the conventional perfective. How long should they ice? Well, we tell them 10 minutes out of every hour until they go to bed that night. Now, with infants and young children, that's a challenge. So that's why even before I've handed my the laser device back to my surgical assistant or before I've taken my goggles off or before we've taken the eye shields out, I'm putting ice on that child immediately and holding it there, not with anything in between, just the cold ice pack right directly on the skin. So we do that very, very aggressively. And in fact, if the poor white stain is, for example, a heavy facial, Lesion. Even before I finish the side of the face, I might start on the forehead and work my way down. But after I finish the forehead, we're already putting the ice on the area and then following it down as I move down with the laser treatment. But I think aggressively early, I think, is the key here. So um, we've had parents with little ones, two, three, four years old. One of them was a little boy that you had treated, Chris Christopher. Um, and she said he complained of pain for several days afterwards. He's getting it done in Arkansas, and he's never done that. So is that because it wasn't iced sufficiently afterwards? Well, I, I don't know what the treatment parameters were that the, the child had treated in Arkansas, so I can't say. But, I mean, we have found it very, very important that you need to ice immediately and aggressively. And if you do that, the kids don't have much swelling. People that actually have the most swelling are the cosmetic patients who, because the pulserations are longer, you know, they don't necessarily, they don't get the bruising, you know, like you did. Right. Uh, if they don't get the bruising, they think that, well, I'm okay, I really don't need to do the icing progressively. They're actually the people that call up and say, you know, I look like a pumpkin this morning. <laughs> I want to. I wanted. I wanted to look like Julia Roberts. You didn't help me with that one. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so we have a question from Stephanie Berger. Her three-month-old daughter was diagnosed with CMTC. She hasn't found a lot of information, but we do have some on our website, Stephanie, and um, we're connected with a doctor from Boston. She's one of our experts on CMTC, Dr. Liang. Um, so um, what are the chances it will fade, and is there anything I can do for the leg discrepancy? And also talk about lasering C CMTC. Well, CMTC, at least the cutaneous component of it, for the most part will go away with the tincture of time. So what I tell the families is it's entirely up to you what you want to do. If you want to watch it and, and not do anything and let it go away with the tincture of time, that's totally fine. Other families will say, well, it's on my daughter's legs below her skirt or my son's shorts. Uh, they're being teased at school. It's become an issue. Then, of course, we will go ahead and treat the kids. And that's very easy to do. And generally, it responds very, very well to the laser treatment after just a couple of issues. In terms of the, if you end up with the limb leg discrepancies, then those children need to be followed very, very closely by orthopedic specialists uh, to make sure that that doesn't get out of control. Okay, thank you. Um, and just so you all know, I'm viewing you all on my laptop and I'm looking at the questions on my iPhone next to me. 
and they're not synchronized so there's some questions that are just on my laptop and they're not showing up on my phone so if we miss you um, uh, Corinne and Kristen will post Dr. Nelson's direct email in the link and you can look for that one mom wants to know Dr. Nelson does everyone who receives treatment from you need a COVID test if they're having it under anesthesia yes okay that's, that's not Stuart Nelson's rule or the Beckman Laser Institute. That is a University of California system-wide medical center rule. Any patient has sedation many times will do a teenager, for example. We won't put them to sleep, but they're concerned. We'll give them a little bit of percent, sort of like when you have your colonoscopy. Those patients fall into that category. But when I leave here, I'm going to go downstairs and treat an 18-year-old. I'm going to do it with a regional block. And no, they don't need to have a COVID test. It's only people having anesthesia or sedation. So you are doing the nerve blocks and they're effective, correct? Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. I know I, I was there and saw it and um, now a lot of people are asking about it because when you had done those laser treatments last year at the VBF conference, they were all saying the results were amazing, they didn't have the pain and they're like, why isn't everybody else doing this? But you have to, I, you have to know what you're doing. I think we get all the cases in the media conference by nerve block. Right, and they all said the same thing. Yeah, yeah it was great. Um, so uh, Slavantna says, my little one has a port wine on V2, and her doctor treated during first session on Perfecta with setting number six. Would you start more aggressive? What's the protocol to get results? I was told next time we'll be at set at 10. Okay, well, I, I, there's no, we don't call it settings. I'm going to assume, hopefully correctly, that Svetlana is talking about the energy density, which we refer to in joules per centimeter squared, or the amount of energy that you're delivering per unit area. So generally, where I will start, I mean, typically, I would have started higher than six. I probably would have started at seven and a half, eight, maybe eight and a half. But with that said, that's based on what I see. I mean, a lot of parents, you know, will sort of get obsessed with, well, somebody did a treatment at eight joules, therefore that's the number. That was the number for that particular child based on what I saw when I did the procedure and the result I saw in the skin after the laser pulses were delivered. So even though I might start at eight, if some child has got a little bit darker skin type, if they've got a bit of a tan, we may back that off. We may see some whitening of the skin, which we don't want to see. So I probably would have started a little bit higher than six. I don't think I would have gone jumped immediately to 10. But again, these numbers need to be looked at in the context of the treatment parameters you use are based on the tissue response that you see. When the residents of the fellows watch me at the clinic, I say to them, don't write down in memory the parameters I use. Look for the response of the skin after the laser pulse is delivered. That will tell you what the correct energy density is. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, Marina has a great question. She thought it might not be topical related, but it is. And she has a port wine stain on her hand, and she said it hurts when it's cold, like you know, any advice? Well, certainly these people do have almost a form of brain on phenomenon where you know, these port wine stains are very sensitive to changes in temperature, either it's cold or 92 degrees in this in New York today. I mean, these lesions very much change. And what I would say is that you'll probably try and elevate that extremity when it becomes painful. Uh, you know, that's really the, probably the only thing that we can do. With the vasomotor response, of the blood vessels in response to the environmental ambient temperatures. So what about, um, I mean, wouldn't you recommend like maybe a cotton glove or something? Like, is there something? Well, as, as I said, it's really a vasomotor, you know, you know, response to the temperature. I mean, I'm not, yeah. it's not really obvious to me how that would be particularly helpful. I mean, you're either pooling too much blood or you're getting vasoconstriction depending on the response right. of the remedy to the temperature uh, differences. What about compression, no? Well, if, if, if somebody's got, you know, a, a clipal trinone syndrome, or we know that there's an association with this birthmark, there's some, um, you know, venous or lymphatic obstruction in that extremity, then absolutely compression would be very, very helpful. So yes, but, you know, particularly in the case where you've got
that's somebody who's got this, you know, perhaps has underlying KT or has a component of KT, not the worst case of it, but does have a localized piece of KT, it would be helpful to do compression. So Marina, just email me through vbfpresident at gmail.com your picture and let me know where you live because um, we can get you in touch with one of our experts to talk about this a little more. A lot of people are saying thank you. Koi wants to know, do, is there any replacement of serolimus cream like Protopic? I've never heard of that. Well, Protopic is used for contact and eczematous dermatitis. So these medications are used to treat, you know, eczema, you know, irritant contact dermatitis uh, in adults and children. Uh, the serolimus, we were the first group to start using the serolimus. So I actually published the first paper on that many years ago with Marty Mim and colleagues. Uh, but the issue with the serolimus is that we, we just didn't find it to be helpful in terms of augmenting the response of the legs. The other issues with the serolimus are that it's very insoluble. And so what that means is that you have to use large amounts of benzyl alcohol to actually dissolve the particulate serolimus to get and we found that can be very irritating to the skin. So it was the result of all of these things together. It wasn't particularly helpful. It was irritating to the skin. It's, it was expensive for many, many patients because it was an off-label use that their insurance company wouldn't have. So for most patients, in fact, all patients, in fact, when that's not something we're doing, and I've discussed this extensively with Roy Shimonimus in New York, and Roy is not doing it either as a standard practice. Right. And we've been taking that stand based on your stand and Dr. Geronimus' stand because we get a lot of people asking us about it. And I've said that you've both done studies that show it's not effective. And it's, the, it's not without complications and um, side effects, correct? No, we had one kid who was a, wasn't an infant because we weren't allowed to test it as young children. But we had one, for my same case, he was a UCI student got profound thrombocytopenia, which we just lately count went way down. And, you know, you can, these medications can be systemically absorbed. And I remember the very first time I spoke to uh, the pharmaceutical company, they were since bought by Pfizer. I can't remember what they were originally. But the medical director said to me, Dr. Nelson, this drug has side effects. Are you sure you want to give this in? It's a young told And, you know, we know that it can result in glucose being spilled in the know the liver function tests can be abnormal and as I said the one case that we had where the patient got a very profound thrombocytopenia so these you know, all medications have side effects and uh, you know you, you need to be aware of that and not just say look we're going to put everybody on serologies. Thank you that's very important information. Um, so um, Jill Hart Kitson said her daughter is five she's being treated with a topical numbing cream but is anxious prior to treatment, I mean, uh, probably putting an EMLA on. We treated regularly from birth to two and have since been treating once or twice per year to maintain. Should I pers pursue Prima laser and hope for more clearance or wait until she is older and more cooperative and hope for better technology? Well, the Prima is going to be the new standard of care probably for the next five to 10 years. I mean, I just don't know whether there'll be any technology that comes onto the market. I mean, I would encourage uh, that child to be treated aggressively while they're younger. I mean, we definitely know that treating infants and young children, you get a better result as opposed to waiting to a teenager or an adult. So I would encourage the family to treat aggressively uh, now while that child is still young. And, you know, I want to make a point, too, for all the parents, and I've talked to Dr. Geronimus about this and you as well, and I've actually got a meeting coming up with Candela. You know, a lot of the outcomes are because there's not uniform, consistent expertise in the use of these lasers. And I know you'll agree, you know, because we're hearing horror stories from some parents of having children treated with the Prima, and others are saying it's been the greatest thing ever and every time I hear the positives, it goes back to you and Dr. Geronimus, and the negatives are coming out of other physicians that don't do as many. You know, Roy does 150 laser treatments a month. You do about 100, I think, right? Like 25 a week? Well, I don't think with you. I, I do about 125 kids a month. They're more okay. the same for marks. If you added in all of the cosmetic procedures, I do probably 200 a month. But, I mean, again, it's like, 
like I've been doing this full time for the last you know 34 years. I just started my 34 years of back to my period of Scott. So I mean, I don't do other dermatology or general surgical procedures. My practice is full time laser. So I mean, again, it gets back to the comment that I made about doing the teaching with the residents and the fellows. It's not I, I treated that child. <laughs> Right, but the, the, the lack of training, the, just the, the lack of consistent training is a problem because physicians buy the laser and the technician trains them. Where we at VBF, that's why we have you and Dr. Geronimus travel with us around the world to train doctors to use these lasers because we want them to be taught properly. And we, I feel the experts like you and Roy are the ones that should be training. That's why we push for this. That's why we bring you on the road with us. And um, as a matter of fact, for everybody still listening, the VBF conference is scheduled for December 12-12, um, 2020. Um, Dr. Geronimus will be doing free laser with the Prima Laser. And that's free. You'll get a free treatment if you come to our conference. Um, if you're worried about the airfare, make sure you get a no-fee change ticket. And what we will be doing, um, our business operations uh, director, Kristen Delgado, has come up with a system and she'll work with Dr. Geronimus where people will get a voucher if, if for some reason we're not live and then they'll be able to get a free treatment with Dr. Geronimus at another time. So we're working everything out to get the clinical, the free treatments, the, the, the talks, but we're hoping we'll be live. I, I think we're going to be, I think we're going to be okay. Um, Elaine? Even if you can't do it live, I mean, I'm participating now in these virtual conferences. They're actually really, really good. You know, if you get a, you know, an organizer and a good technician person, it's actually really good. You know, I can be speaking live to a large number of people with my slides, with my picture over the corner so they see me and then they see the slides. It actually, this virtual technology for medical meetings is, I think, something that's going to be here to stay. I agree. The problem is the biggest benefit for our families are the psychosocial sessions where they all are together getting the dental exam because only two or three doctors in the country know how to do a dental exam with um, patients that have oral involvement from vascular anomalies and the free laser. You know, people come, they want to meet other families. There's no question, you know, our governor said he wants kids back in the classroom because of the psychosocial impact of being in a classroom. Has it worked? Can it work? Yes, but not for everybody. And I think what's going to happen is there'll be a modification of some virtual and some in-person as best we can accommodate going forward. The good part is it opens us up now to many more speakers that we can have at our conference in a virtual, in a room where we run virtual live sessions and then have the other rooms where we have the actual live speakers who'll do the actual clinic appointments. So there's pros and cons. Um, so Elaine is saying thank you for an interesting webinar and your time. I wonder if you're seeing any issues with swabbing for COVID in those vascularity and their oral nasal pharynx, AKA bleeding or inflammation. No, no found because COVID and that's been an issue. And then Corinne and Kristen, that's another question I'd like to add to our uh, COVID survey. If you could, one of you could write that down. So that's three now. Has there been any um, issues with a vascular anomaly that's in the nasal area or the oral area that's resulted in any, any bleeding from swabbing or testing? Um, so Claudia said her son just started laser treatment. He's seven months old. He's having it every three weeks, and the bruising takes 2.5 weeks to heal. Is this a normal time frame for treatment and healing, having a treatment in Sydney, Australia? Well, I, I, if they're having lots of bruising like that, I'm going to assume the physicians in Sydney are using very, very short pulse durations of the laser. You know, again, 
again, a lot of people associate, well, they've got to be bruised to get a good treatment result. You know, that's not necessarily true. If, if the blood vessel's larger, if the child gets older, or if it's an adult, or many times using pulsations of a laser, which are not going to cause a bruise and hurts. I have not been aware of, you know, going as short as three weeks from most of our work. You know, we've been following what Roy was doing. And four weeks is about right. I have not seen any data that doing it any shorter than that would be particularly helpful. So whether it's three, whether it's four, I have done treatments at intervals of three weeks because there was a mitigating issue and insurance was going to expire or an authorization was going to expire. So we have done that, but that is not our routine practice to do it that if those intervals are as short. I mean, people understand, you know, that you are inflaming the skin when you're doing laser treatment. It is going to take some time for the skin to calm down. So it's two things, really. It's this, well, and I'll ask you. So it's the fact that the skin needs to calm down so it can be receptive for the next treatment because you don't want to over-treat and cause any damage, but also you want the purpura to clear, correct? Yeah, the purpura, but particularly if it's short pulse of the yeah. Yeah. That's going to take some time to clear. And when you use the short pulserations of the laser, you're also more likely to injure the most superficial layer of the skin, the epidermal melanin. So taken together, you know, when somebody's getting really, really bruised, you probably need to back off and do them a little bit uh, longer intervals just to allow the skin time to heal. Okay. Um, so Koi said her daughter is nine months old and she had... they. They tried the 755 laser with 595, but no clearance. Does it help to use the 595 with a larger spot size? Yes, I mean, definitely the larger spot size with the Prima has helped a lot. Particularly, or I've noticed that the most dramatically is probably some of the older kids and some of the young adults who we got to a point where they just some more of just not clearing anymore. The ability to use these larger spots get a higher energy density deeper in the skin has definitely helped a lot. So I would encourage you to, to seek that treatment with the brain if you can. Okay. So Donna asks a good question, Donna Donna, and she wants to know if we'll have virtual access to the conference if there's no desire to travel. One of the things about that is we've had the honor of having our doctors actually present really live cases, the before and after, so that families can see them. And we're not really allowed to, quote, publish those unless we have consent. So all of our doctors presenting would have to make sure every case that they're presenting. And this is why we have never done a virtual, because we tried it 15 years ago, and there were a lot of HIPAA and legal issues with it. But in the COVID climate, I'm not sure. You know, we'll try. There'll be certainly things that we can record and then poss possibly record them and allow access to them um, on our website. So, I mean, when we have our meeting, um, our manager's meeting, I can bring that up. And it is brought up because we would like to make this accessible to so many people. But one of the advantages of being in person is that you see live cases presented by these physicians, you know, actual cases that they're working on, which we can do when it's in person. But we'll, we will try. Um, Jill said, thank you so much for all the helpful information. Um, so we have six minutes left. And one of the things um, I'd like to talk to Dr. Nelson about and see if he's had any feedback is I've had, um, is there even this morning, I had another person say, is there any kind of face covering that VBF is recommending during um, the pandemic and for travel because the cotton and the cloth ones irritate the port wine stain. So I was like, maybe you can get like a plastic shield, but then she was saying they weren't allowing those on the airplane. So I don't know if you've had any issues, but even two of our board members who have facial port wine stains said that the cloth uh, facial masks have been irritating their port wine. Well, what worked? What we're doing here in, at Backman is we're following the lead from the Asian countries. And by that, I mean Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, who were in this a lot before we were. And the recommendations that came out for their medical providers were to double mask, where I am wearing an N95 mask, and 
that's the mass that you saw all those horrible pictures that came out of New York in late March, early April, uh, where it's a very restrictive mass. It has the adhesive, so I don't know if you can actually see almost the butterfly markings on my cheeks. It's hard to wear that all day long. There's no doubt about that, but that's the best protection. And then over that, I'm wearing a conventional surgery mask. And then on top of that, I'm wearing the face shield when I'm actually doing the procedure. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in terms of safety, I would tell you to try and get an N95 mask when you're out in public. But more than the safety, they're saying the the masks are irritating the port wine stain, and they're all. Couple told me it was bleeding. Couple said it was all scabby and scaly from the cloth constantly rubbing up against it. Well, if that's an issue, then perhaps those people have got some vascular nodules, which needs to be flattened and smoothed out. Yeah, and they did. Exactly. They do. I yeah. A lot. I mean, I, I've not had one of my family. You know, the children are wearing masks here at Beckham when they come in for their procedures, and their parents are. And not, not. I have not yet since we reopened had one parent tell me that there was an issue uh, with their port wine stain irritating their children. Yeah, it's been the adults. Um, one of them is your patient, Jeff, who's on our board. He no, and he's a nurse, you know, and he's noticed a lot of irritation from it. But I mean, it's it, it's just something that um, we I've heard from a, a couple people. But it could be you're right that it's the thickness or certain types of port wine stains or the material against it. I mean, no time in history have people been forced to walk around and wear a covering over their face for so long. No, but no time in history. So I think we're going to just be learning a lot as we go along here. Um, so I have one more question before we wrap it up. Linda Lynch is a dental nurse and she couldn't wear the um, mask as her port wine stain was irritated and bled slightly. So she's, in, she's saying that, that as a nurse that, that it was happening to her as well. Well, Dr. Nelson, this has been an amazing session, uh, very informative. I look forward to seeing you next month in California. Maybe we'll be able to do a session together live if, um, if you know, this, if things are better. We'll play it by ear, but, you know, we're, we, we make sure that we still get the information out to everybody. We do the best that we can. Um, all, these videos are going to continue to be available on our website at birthmark.org and on our Facebook page. And last but not least, we still have a lot of our totes, Mother of Birthmark totes, and our Put on Your Birthmark caps for a $50 donation to VBF. Stay tuned for more information on our website on our purple polka dot race. No matter where you are in the world, you can participate as a virtual runner or walker in our purple polka dot race. So go to our website at birthmark.org to read more about it. And um, Kristen or Corinne can put a link right below um, all the comments here to the purple polka dot race so we can get you all to join and participate. We have two teams that are warring against each other. Our chairman of the board, Corinne, has a lot of the board members and her friends and colleagues on one side and Scott. Our global ambassador, I've joined Scott, so I'm trying to get, um, we're, we're, we're in competition to see how much money each team can raise. It's all for a good cause. It's all to support us getting everybody an accurate diagnosis and appropriate information. So thank you, Dr. Nelson, for your time. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the valuable information, and I will see you very soon. And stay okay. tuned, everyone, for the announcements of our up-and-coming Facebook Live sessions. Take care. Bye-bye. Be well, everybody. Stay